the speaker is Professor Moi Win. He's at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, uh, before joining MIT, he was working in a company, so he has the view of both worlds, industrial and academia. Uh, he, has, he is a fellow of different engineering societies, and he's a recipient of a large number of awards and distinctions. Today, he's going to speak about his current research, and the title of his talk, I see now a chain, but in my note is very appealing, location, location, as you didn't get, and location again. So, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Mic is on, right? So, um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the uh, uh, local organizer. Uh, thank you for the chair for uh, having me here. This is especially a, a nice place to come to. This is my second time. And I hope I'll be here uh, much more often. Um, so with that, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, what we've been doing for uh, at least uh, the last uh, five, six years. And uh, this is sort of how we view uh, positioning, um, lo localization, navigation. Um, the only thing that uh, I think uh, slightly, maybe it's just a very slightly, is that uh, we like to think of uh, outdoor problem as well as indoor problems. And in, se in some sense, we are thinking of sort of a ubiquitous localization. And uh, when uh, I transitioned to this uh, area, it wasn't so clear that this is going to be this, this vibrant. And this, as you can imagine, a conference like this, you come here and you see there's a lot of activity. So now I think I would think of this as the, the three most important thing. Um, to, 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 to do is, 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 is listed here, and hence uh, my uh, title that I provided to the organizers. So, um, so if you think about this, the first question you may ask is that, uh, what is the next frontier in, in our field? So our field mean broadly speaking, there are people here with uh, many different background, uh, some people that are doing electronics, some people that are doing uh, positioning, some people that are doing algorithms and inference and this sort of machine learning. There were talks on, uh, you know, deep uh, network, deep learning, all of that stuff. So if you kind of look at it from that perspective, what's the sort of the, the next thing that coming up in the horizon? And that is what uh, uh, um, describe here with this uh, phrase that the space being the next frontier. So this was the question that I think was asked about uh, 15, 20 years ago, if you're kind of looking at it. And space, really thinking of you know, using more than one antenna system uh, as far as uh, 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 our world goes. So there are many systems that are built now. A lot of Wi-Fi cards even now have uh, multiple antennas. So this was... Uh, 15 years ago, view that uh, a quote from a famous uh, Professor Lindsay, who has written multiple books on synchronization, satellite systems, and so on. So now we're going kind of fast forward, and uh, and uh, we are going to do to, to see how this is, might be uh, related to uh, a topic like that. So just kind of a very brief background. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. This is my group. We work on a lot of different problems, certainly this uh, multiple antenna problems and so on, but we're just generally interested in distributed uh, processing, signal processing, networks and things like that. And it's not so important even this, but the kind of things that uh, we like to uh, emphasize is that whatever we do, we wanted to understand what's the best we can do. Uh, only then we can design algorithms that uh, achieve those uh, 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 performance limit, uh, and then, you know, uh, then we can perform experimentation. So, I mean, this is the kind of uh, uh, place that where I don't need to emphasize a lot about uh, experimentation. If you go and look at the poster session, there are a lot of posters, a lot of talks on uh, 
things that are involved in devices and so on. So it's, this is really, but this is important because you can uh, validate your algorithms and you can validate your theory. Um, and uh, we've been doing a lot of work on uh, <clears throat> what we call physical layer techniques. So this is the, 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 what, uh, the techniques that allow you to sort of talk to two wireless devices and, and so on. And more recently, we've been thinking of a network. So what sort of issues that you have in network? One of the issues that you have is the interference. When the node are transmitting in a network, in a case like a positioning network, you have to have many beacons, you have to have many texts, and they all cooperate, and so on. So it's a network interference in the network is an issue. And, and certainly, the, uh, the, the talk of today is about uh, location awareness, so I'm kind of going to, do, to, to spend a lot of time. The two aspects that are important are are uh, synchronization. So there was, a, I also see a few papers in synchronization. And synchronization is quite important when you do positioning because they're quite, you need to have some sense uh, clock to agree on before you can really figure out where you are. And the other part is that uh, the secrecy part is, is becoming important. You know, if you are having little islands that, uh, uh, operating, it, it's okay, you can kind of keep everything secure, but if you b become ubiquitous, what do you do with this problem of somebody trying to spoof you uh, in your uh, uh, network and so on? This is quite uh, important. And, and the last thing, which I don't know what I'm really talking about, but it becomes also important from a uh, very physics point of view is to look at uh, networks with uh, quantum mechanical properties and, and they also have quite important uh, role in, in the positioning systems. Okay. So this is something maybe I can tell you in three years from now, but uh, right now I'm sort of you know, in search of what's, what's the important issue in that area. So when we think of the positioning problem, uh, we start with the basically application. So everything that we do is application driven. Uh, application drives what kind of technology you have, what kind of technology people are building. And uh, once you have that technology, you can figure out what sort of algorithm you can design. And of course, in the middle is the uh, theoretical foundation. So I'm gonna actually start talking about the, the theoretical foundation quite quickly. Um, so, Kind of recap, what I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking is that, uh, you know, here's a problem. And the problem is that we wanted to provide uh, reliable positioning, especially when you don't have infrastructure. If you have a lot of infrastructure, if you have a lot of access point, then this problem is in some sense uh, solved. You can even see vendors here uh, showing uh, different kind of setup where you go and deploy a lot of uh, beacons or anchors, and then from there you can figure it out what to do with this, okay? Um, but when you don't have this infrastructure or when you don't have uh, 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 accurate, like an inertia measurement unit or so, what are the things that you can do? And uh, what we propose is that to really exploit nodes in the network uh, who are, let's say, your friends and try to help each other among your friends. So, what we mean by that is that we wanted to exploit spatial cooperations in the network. Spatial space, meaning that you and your neighbor, you and your friend, wanted to help each other to, 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 to achieve what you were trying to achieve. Okay? And of course, we have challenges that we all know. I mean, everybody comes to this conference know what the challenges are. I mean, the challenges are that, you know, you might get a measurement from, you know, Wi-Fi, you might get a measurement from IMU, you might get a measurement from Anchor, uh, sorry, uh, uh, from a camera. And how do you kind of combine all of them? And, you know, while we're doing this, you know, the, the ultrasonic acoustic sort of came into place, a little surprise, but now how do you do use that information as well? So how do you kind of really fuse all of the information that you have available in a very dynamic environment. 
And you know, we're going to do this in, a, in, in the three ways that we talk about, so I'm not going to do, repeat them, but these are the three important things. So let me kind of start uh, thinking about it. So we have some theoretical work, we have some network issues, uh, sorry, we have uh, algorithms and we have uh, a network issues. So a few years ago, I gave a talk here in Akala, and that was only three pieces. That was um, theory, algorithms, and experimentation. But when we started to do experimentation, we realized that there are other problems that come about. And that's com these are the problems that come about when you think of a network. How do you operate a network? How do you use your energy efficiently? How do you schedule your network? In other words, if a lot of us wanted to localize where we are, then we need to figure it out who gets to talk first and who gets to localize first. And we wanted to do it in some optimal fashion, so some of the network issues also come about. And, and, and then we have uh, experimentation, we have example, and so on. So you see that my list is sort of growing. It's like a book chapter. So when I started working on it five years ago, we only had these bold title, and we started to make a list of the kind of battles that we have to conquer, and we go and, uh, and uh, at deal with one at a time. So whenever you see a blue one, that th we have results that we can talk about, we can share with you. And some of the things that, uh, that you see here, we know that we have problems, but we don't, haven't really solved it, and we are going to solve it. And we're pretty sure that we will solve these in uh, the next year or so. So what I wanted to first do is to first talk about theory, because without theory, we don't know what to do. We, we are going to design algorithm based on the theory that we learn, and our theory has to give you sort of a blueprint. And this is sort of my, not my original word. Uh, when I was at Bell Labs, uh, I get to uh, interact closely with uh, Jerry Foschini, who was uh, the, the, the forefront of the multiple antenna systems. And I was a young kid going to him, and he usually tell me that, you know, you want to do a good theory that gives you a blueprint to go architect the network. Okay? So here, what I'm hoping to do in the next 15, 20 minutes is to talk a little bit about theory that help us design the algorithms. So uh, by now, I have mentioned to you that I wanted to do cooperation. And by the way, if you are in a very difficult environment, what you would like to have is a bandwidth. And you will see that as you have more and more bandwidth, you'll be able to localize better and better. So, you know, things like uh, ultra wideband systems are, 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 are just natural for uh, positioning. In fact, I did a thesis on um, ultra wideband radio, and, and in fact, we, we, we were the one that calling the word impulse radio, uh, something like uh, close to 20 years ago. And uh, during my thesis, I realized that uh, solving a problem and positioning is a good thing because of, I have a lot of bandwidth, but I never have enough time to, to solve it. And, and if I did, I wouldn't be finishing my, my uh, degree, so I have to finish with something that, uh, that I can put together and I leave this problem later. So now, what I wanted to do is that I want to bring in this uh, wideband issue. Okay. But this one is not entirely necessary. If you have a narrower band system, let's say you just have a couple of megahertz bandwidth or hundreds of megahertz bandwidth, you still will be able to do what I'm talking about, except that you don't have as good accuracy in making, uh, 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 for example, a range measurement. So you can't sense the environment quite well if you don't have large enough bandwidth, but with that bandwidth, we can live. So the, the, when we start thinking about an, a network, we start thinking of like power and bandwidth as resources, and we will do best possible performance giving these constraints. Okay. So let me uh, begin. So this is already something that we talked about. High accuracy localization is a problem, and we're going to use cooperative techniques. So this is the picture that I have in mind. 
you have a lot of beacons. Maybe they are satellites or maybe they are access points and so on. These are with the red square and they know where they are. And uh, a lot of time you can have that situation if they have a GPS. And, uh, but the blue notes are the one that uh, wanted to determine where they are so they are lost. And we know from a high school that if you can make three measurement, you can determine the position of the node. Okay? We can determine the position of the node. However, if your measurements are noisy, okay, measurement are noisy in the case of uh, you have some problem with, uh, let's say, uh, making a distance measurement because of a non-line of sight or something, then this accuracy is going to drop and you're not going to have as good of an accuracy here. But you know, that, that's not a problem because we understand statistics and statistical theory said that you can have noisy measurement as long as you have enough measurement, if they're independent, then we should be able to overcome our limitation due to noise. Okay? So what we want to do is that, you know, hey, I want to make many, many measurements, not just three measurements. So for the case, so how can you do? And of course, you can install more beacons or you can launch more satellites or you can put up more cellular towers or so on. But that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is that we want to cooperate. So we wanted to have our friends help us and we will help our friends. And in that case, then I can improve my accuracy. And also this node, it was lost because you can only have two measurements and then when you make more measurement, then you have this node can also determine. And, of, and this, things like this you can multiply, you can make more and more measurements between all possible pairs and, and then we will be able to, to determine the accuracy. So what we have done in the recent past is that we develop a theory to determine ultimate limit, meaning what's the best we can do in a setup like this. Okay. And, of course, we don't want it to just have a theory, the prove a theorem and we're done. We wanted to have insights, so we develop geometrical interpretation of some of the results and that will tell us how to go uh, design algorithms. Okay, so quickly, a system model is that if I am uh, in, a, in a network with a number of nodes and I am, I have, let's say, uh, 100 agents, 100 mobile agents, and then I have maybe 10 or 12 anchors that uh, with some position X and Y. And between each of the uh, agent, uh, you can get the receive signal. So if I'm uh, agent K, I get the signal that transmitted by other beacons or one of my friends, okay? So I get many, many pair of these signals and they are the delay version, so this is a lot of multipath and weighted, so this is due to fading plus the additive noise, okay? So this is sort of what we have. And, and so this is the, these are the observation we have and then we're saying that, okay, giving these observation, what I wanted to do is to find out where I am and where my friends are. And so from here, you're trying to figure out how the position of the nodes in the network related to what I can observe. You see, all I have it is this R, okay? So this is a waveform, okay? So this is everything that we have as we receive. Of course, if you buy a device, maybe you're not going to get this. You might just get the total power, like an RSSI in your measurement. Or if you have this, uh, card, uh, Wi-Fi card that uh, Intel has, then you can start measuring the channel state information. So you can measure the, the amplitude and the phase of, 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 of the, the channel and things like that. So you, but you know, what you would like is that you wanted to have an entire waveform so that you can do everything that uh, you want. You can design all sorts of clever algorithms and so on. And the uh, position information that you need sort of is hidden in here in a very nonlinear way, very nonlinear way, right? So how do you extract this information based on all the observation? That's sort of the problem setup that we have, okay? And now 
what I want to do is that I wanted to list everything that uh, I don't know in this system. So the first things that I don't know is the position of, of where I am and position of my friends are. So they are like X and Y for all of these uh, agents and I'm going to put them in a long vector and I'm going to write them as P. And all the multipath delays and amplitudes, I'm going to put them in this vector associated with the node one and I'm going to put this in this vector associated with the node 2 and so on. So this theta is very, very large, maybe uh, uh, 10,000 by 10,000 by 1 vector. So it's very long vector, even though the P is like 200, because I have 100 nodes, so if I'm thinking of a two-dimensional problem, I have X and Y. And this is, this is re really what we care about, but this is all the unknown parameter. So if you take a book uh, in like an estimation theory, you have sort of a parameter that you list in a setup like you have on an estimation problem. And this is what I want, okay? This is what I want. So now my goal is to try to understand what I can learn, what I can infer about the vector P in the presence of all of these things that I don't care about. And of course, if I can throw them away, it's good. Because if I can throw them away, I can start thinking about this better and better. Otherwise, these are going to sort of cloud my ability to observe this P. And to do this, I'm going to uh, look at the uh, so-called information inequality. And information inequality says that if I have a the positions vector, and if I try to estimate this vector by uh, p hat, and this is the error, so the error matrix satisfied this inequality where the right hand side is the so-called uh, Fisher information matrix. So we know that Fisher information matrix have everything that we want to know about our, our system, okay? So everything that we need to know is in here, so I'm going to go after that, that matrix. So for Fisher information matrix is like this. You have a big, big matrix correspond to this vector, and, uh, and uh, a small part, so let's say if this is 200, this would be 200 by 200, and the rest is just all the things that I don't care about. And what I need to do is that I need to invert this 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, and probably your MATLAB can do it if you have a reasonable computer. And then what you will need to do is go and take only the part that correspond to vector P, meaning that only take the yellow part, and that's all you care. Okay? And this is what I want, because if I want to know my position, if I'm a node k and it's, if I wanted to know what's the best I can do in terms of a mean square error, this is lower bounded by trace of one of these little red squares. So if I'm a node number 3, k equal 3, I go down to the third red square, and that trace of that little 2 by 2 matrix is, is basically give me the answer. So you can't do better than this. Okay? So this is what we call ultimate limit. And of course, of course, uh, what we are going to introduce is that, you know, this thing is not something I want. I wanted to get rid of it. So I wanted to kind of think about a notion that uh, allow me to throw away some of these, and yet I retain everything that I wanted to know about a vector P. Okay, so, I can, so the game now is that I can throw things away as long as I don't lose information. Okay, I can throw things away as long as I don't lose information. And you can do that by this concept called equivalent Fisher information, and we use the word equivalent because in a sense you don't lose any information. And you get that by doing this thing called sure complement. So there are a lot of people know what sure complement is. This is, is a pretty standard uh, uh, matrix uh, algebra problem. But if you don't know, uh, here's a, a one minute uh, uh, sure complement is that if you have a big matrix corresponding to a vector theta, so let's say this is a theta and this is the part that I'm interested in, this is the part that I don't care. Okay? 
Then what you will do is that you go and break this matrix according to this. So you break them in, 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 in pieces and you form this matrix. And this is as simple as this. This is called the Shore complement. And this has all the information you need about the vector theta one that you're interested in. In my case, it would be P. Okay, it might, might be P. So the idea is the following. You have this, say, 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, and all you only care is this. So what you are going to do is that you're going to take an inverse and you're going to take the yellow part. And now, according to this, I'm going to subdivide this matrix subdivide this matrix, and what I want is this yellow part without inverse. So this is what I call equivalent Fisher information, and instead of doing all of this, this sure complement will allow you to go there directly. Okay? So now, I now have much smaller matrix, something like 200 by 200, and I can throw away all the things that are uh, clouding my ability to gain insights. Okay? You know, you can do this, go to the computer, get the numerical results, and get a plot for your ultimate limit as a function of SNR without spending all of this time. And the fact that we are spending this time is that we wanted to gain insights. Okay, we wanted to gain insights. So what do we learn? Okay, what do we learn? The first thing we learn is that before we even do the short complement, even with the very big matrix, the information matrix that we have is the sum of two matrices. Okay? The first one is the information that coming from beacons or anchors, and the second one is information coming from a cooperation. So that's sort of a already giving you a proof that uh, whatever system that you are designing, you can do much better if you cooperate. Okay? So, don't have your agent talk to only the beacons. Let your agent help each other, and you're going to gain a lot of information. So that's the important message. And sure enough that if we do this short complement, this stays the same. And it has to stay the same because this, we haven't lost any information. Now, what you're going to learn is the, a few things. So let's take a look. Now that I have much smaller matrix that I can deal with, I can look at the structure. The information that coming from anchors are going to be uh, written like this, and it's a block diagonal matrix. So these are the little red square that uh, you see in the previous picture. So these are two by two matrix, two by two matrix, two by two matrix along the block, along the diagonal, and everything else is zero. And you can, we also understand what each of these things are. So let's kind of spend some time on it. Uh, and before we go there, what I wanted to mention is that these are due to cooperation. Okay, so this is the cooperations, and we're going to talk pretty carefully about what these lambdas are, because this is the information that I'm getting at node k is the sum of the information that coming from individual beacon. So if I have four beacons, if I have four beacons, I'm going to gain information from one at a time. And if you're not happy with your performance, you can install the fifth beacon, the sixth beacon, and the information is just going to keep adding. You're not going to lose information because you're going to uh, install more beacon. It's just going to be a gain. And how much you gain, here's the key, how much you gain depends on lambda. Lambda is sort of like a, what we call information intensity of a pos uh, position. So you gain information according to lambda. So we need to figure out what lambda is. If we know how to optimize lambda, we're going to, to get more information, and that's sort of some, where we are going. Um, I'm going to do, explain this a little bit more, because this is important, and it's also going to give you a geometric insight. So what it, this says is that uh, if I have a three beacon and I'm here, and if I make a distance measurement with respect to this beacon, I gain information. And the information I gain is in, in along this direction. So that's why we call these uh, ranging directional matrix. And the direction is specified by this angle phi, 
with respect to your coordinate system. And you can't gain information in any other direction. So if you, that's why it's topology of your network is important, where you install the anchor, where you install the beacon is important, okay? If you install a beacon here, you're gonna in, gain information along this line. And for the second beacon, you're gonna gain information along this line. And the third beacon, you're gonna gain information along this line. And how much information you gain, i.e. how big my arrows are, how tall my arrows are, depends on lambda. Okay, the larger the lambda, the bigger it is. So you, we have to think about it, what lambda is. So again, this is sum over all the anchors. This is the ranging information intensity. These are two by two matrix, but they only have one non-zero eigenvalue, meaning that they are not full rank, and that's why you only get one direction. So these are just uh, rank one matrix. So lambda, I mentioned that lambda is important, and here it is. Lambda is given by this expressions and and before I explain it, let's sort of take a look at this. So this is the old uh, the wideband radio thinking. If you transmit uh, 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 impulses, like uh, I, in, in, in now, this sort of stuff is in a chip. Uh, uh, I don't know the signaling structure quite well, but I'm sure uh, it's some kind of a 802 something standard in, in these chips. So, uh, so you're gonna have some impulses. So if you transmit a pulse, what you're going to do see is some delay version of it, some echoes, okay? So I'm gonna use it as an example or for a talking point. And what we see is that if you have a gap, okay? So if you're designing a system and if you receive something like that, if you see a gap, what we learned is that this part is useful, this part is not useful, so don't even go and process it, okay? If you process it, you're wasting your time. If you Sampling it, you're wasting your time. Assuming that you can scan this somehow, and if you see a gap, the only thing that you care is, is this part. And this is, this is what we, we, we call the effective bandwidth. So S of F is the power spectral density of a waveform like this, and this is the effective bandwidth, and you see that ranging information intensity increase with the effective bandwidth. That's why if you have wider and wider bandwidth, your lambdas is getting larger and larger. You know? So you, you know, if you have an option to design a waveform, these are the kind of things that you wanted to go and, and optimize. And this is due to the interference of the multipath that interfering your first path. And this is between zero and one, so if there's no interference, this is going to be zero and that's the best situation. If there's some interference, when these things are overlapping, this is going to do some reduction. And signal to noise ratio. So here's the drastic difference between communications problem and localization problem. So if you receive a waveform like that during, if you're doing communications like a CDMA or impulse radio or spread spectrum system, anything that you can think of, what you wanted to do is that you want to detect these peaks and you wanted to combine them. This is what people call rake receiver in the communications, okay? If you're designing a, so if you're carrying your, uh, I don't know, smartphone, all of them will have some kind of a combining, um, uh, like a rake-like combining, you're combining basically echoes or multipath here. But if you're doing localization, you don't need to do the rake reception. In fact, all you care is the signal to noise ratio of the first path. And that sort of makes sense because that's where the time of arrival information is there, right? Time of arrival information is there. And so this is uh, uh, what I call the sanity check case, just to make sure that your equations are right, so you wanted to do the simple thing that, that you do. So let's suppose that multipath is resolvable like this. Okay, and of course, again, here's a, another reason. If you go wider and wider bandwidth, your signal is going to resolve multipath. So this is what we wrote in our first few papers that if you have a wide band system, the multipath is resolvable, and therefore, you're not going to have so much fading. Okay, so here, when you have multipath resolved, none of these things are going to matter, 
and your results is just this, okay? And this stuff is interesting because if you go to very classical book like uh, Van Tree's book on this estimation, there's a, like in a page number 200, there's a homework problem to determine the time of arrival of a signal in the additive white Gaussian noise. Okay, there's no multipath, just additive white Gaussian noise. Uh, the expressions that you will get is similar to this. Okay, so what this says is that even if you are in a multipath environment, okay, even if you are in a multipath environment, if your first path is resolvable, that's like I'm in an additive white Gaussian noise channel. This is like in, I'm in a happy world when the channel is resolved. Okay? And you're going to be in happier and happier world if you have wider and wider bandwidth because you're going to resolve more and more. So it's a probabilistic thing. With high probability, these paths are going to be resolved. Okay? So this is, this is sort of what we learned. Now, the other thing about geometric interpretation is important, so let me spend a few more minutes on geometric interpretation. And geometric interpretation says the following. Remember, I have these three beacons, and I'm going to do ranging. And when I do my ranging, I'm going to gain information along these green arrow direction, and so on. Okay? So now, with this, and we also know how big the arrows are. These are lambda. Now, I wanted to ask a question. Say, give me all the points in this two-dimensional plane that satisfy this equality, meaning that this is my equivalent Fisher information about my node P. So I am a position P, and this is a two-by-two two matrix. What I can do is I can diagonalize. And I can diagonalize because these are non-negative definite matrices. So I have two eigenvalue, mu and uh, eta. Okay? And I'm asking myself, or I'm asking you, and say, take this inverse, two by two matrix, you can invert it easily. You learned it the first thing when you study uh, matrix. And then you do this and show me all these points such that this is equal to one. And this has a beautiful, beautiful property, beautiful, beautiful property, that these points give me the ellipse. And in fact, I knew that uh, the major and minor are axis of this ellipse, that these are mu n square root of n. By the way, in my picture, I picked the coordinate axis to be this black two arrow x and y, the usual thing. But really, you don't really have to do this because this says that you can rotate and the way that you should rotate is like along this line, so you can forget about the original axis and you can think about the new axis, okay? Now, what I will tell you without a proof, so this one you have to trust, is that position error bound for my node, for me here, depends on how big the ellipse is. Because how big the eigenvalues will determine how well I can determine where I am, okay? So basically, when you're designing a system, you wanted to make these ellipses big, okay? So if you're not happy with this ellipse, and you can call your uh, service operator, or I don't know, in Europe, you call Vodafone or something, and you can complain. Or maybe if you don't know where you are very well in a building like that, you call uh, your uh, professor rector and says, you know, I don't have a good coverage, can you install another beacon? So you install another beacon. So you know, already, you, the first question that comes to your mind is that, where should I put that new beacon? Or where should I put the new base station? And it turns out that, let's suppose that you put it here, then I know exactly how well I'm going to do because I'm going to gain information only in this direction. You can see that theory is start giving me insights because I know that it's only going to gain along this direction. And when you add a new information, the new red arrow, I have a new, new uh, matrix and I have a new ellipse. And you notice the ellipse is drawn precisely, meaning that it enclosed the O1. So information ellipse, grow, okay, information ellipse grows. And this is how um, uh, uh, we want to think about it. And in fact, we like to think of this information ellipse as an information evolution. 
If you're moving in the network, these ellipses are going to change depending on the different lambda that you're going to see, and this is going to tell you how to design a dynamical system. This is going to tell you how to navigate through uh, a certain environment. So you can see that this is only the eighth edition of IPIN, right? This is the eighth edition, is that right? There's a lot more to come. There's a lot more to work on, a lot more problems to work on. Um, so you're going to navigate through using this uh, information ellipse. Okay, so I'm going to pause here just for a second. What I just told you in the last 30 minutes has nothing really new, right? Because this is how every localization system work. You make a distance measurement, you make a distance measurement, you kind of do, you know, triangulation, and then you sound a little smarter if you say, ah, oh, multilateration, and so on. But that's what everybody does. That's how GPS will work, or just roughly speaking, right? But what's new in the last 30 minutes is perhaps a way to think about this, a way to think about it, okay? And we wanted to, to see how to think about it on the simplest possible way to really gain insight so you can build up and think about more complicated things, okay? So the next slide that I'm going to show is a new thing. And still, it's a very simple thing and in fact, you know, I start out by saying that, you know, I want to determine the ultimate limits and I'm going to design algorithms, right? So analogy of the ultimate limits is like determining the capacity of your communication channel. And then algorithms is like designing codes that, you know, that give you a near capacity or close to capacity. So here too, we gain these insights in the analogy to communications, you have a binary symmetric channel, right? Very simple binary symmetric channel, but you learned a lot. So here too, I wanted to look for something very simple. Okay, a very simple thing in my case is going to be this. So this is new now. I have beacons and I have two nodes. And each of them will do the usual way, triangulation with uh, different lambdas and it has an ellipse. And this node, my friend, will do the same thing and it has an ellipse. Okay? Now the new part is that you want to make more measurement without calling your rector and getting new base station or a new beacon. Let's just help each other. Okay, so when you help each other, you're going to gain some information. How much you're going to gain and how, where you're going to gain, we know now because we've done uh, 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 a lot of work with the simple case, we're going to gain information along this direction and this node will gain some information, this node will gain some information and when you combine them, the ellipse will get better, bigger and we're in the happy world. Okay? So that's sort of my, sort of like a first conclusion. And so we have a way to think about a wideband system, information ellipse, and we have a geometrical insight so that we can do many things from now, okay? So we can do many things. Uh, one of the things that we can do is that we can design algorithms. And I'm just not going to, 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 to spend time talking about it because I want to tell you something newer results, but I will tell you that the algorithm design is quite straightforward. You learn how to do statistical inference on graph. And you realize that our network is also on a graph, so you can run these graphical base algorithms to determine where everybody is in, in the network. Okay? So we've done it, and we also implemented on, on, uh, using our radios. Uh, uh, we had uh, implemented uh, these on a network of many of the time domain radios, and it works wonderfully. And we recently are putting together smaller boxes using DecaWave chips, and uh, we'll see uh, if we put it together right. If we put it together right, we will run algorithms on it, and, and it all works, okay? But what I wanted to tell you a little bit is that beyond this, you need to think about a network. Because if you wanted to have a ubiquitous system, indoor, outdoor, working seamlessly, all of that stuff, you need to think about a network. When you think about a network, you're going to have different kind of problems. You're going to have 
Uh, different bandwidth availability, you might be in a system where you have lots of bandwidth, people have to share bandwidth, or power, and so on. So what I wanted to do is I want to pick one problem and uh, to tell you how we think about the uh, uh, power optimization. And this is, um, um, this is going to be fairly short. So we call it sparsity property, and you'll see what I mean by end of the talk, uh, sparsity property. It will play a very important role in, in, in resource allocation for localization. Okay? I wanted to, again, differentiate that resource allocation problem has been done for communications, and there are thousands of paper if you go Google. But there aren't too many work on resource allocation for positioning, resource allocation for navigation, and so on. So that's what I wanted to, to look at. So, you know, you can think of this as a bandwidth as well, but let me just talk about power. Maybe it's, it's easier to think about. So we're going to have to look at it, and the aim is to allocate the power. You know, you have a fixed budget of power. You want to allocate among nodes in a network so as to maximize the uh, performance uh, or, or uh, improve, uh, maximize the uh, location accuracy. Okay? So the way that I'm going to think about is, again, um, um, the following. I wanted to localize this node. These are my anchors. And I have total power. And I wanted to know how much power I should put it on this node, how much power I should put it on this node, and so on. Should I put power evenly, or should I put them a lot on a faraway node, like, you know, what is it called, a power control in a cellular network, right? You give a lot of power to a faraway node, that kind of stuff. So that's kind of, I want to ask that question, how much power I should allocate among all of these nodes that are going to help me position this? And this has basically a very related problem when people are thinking of maybe in the world of IPIN, this is called passive localization. It's basically a radar problem. You transmit and you look at the reflection where the node is not co cooperating. Okay, so this is just a very passive, you're gonna transmit. And in fact, you can talk about MIMO radar in the sense that you transmit out of many, many antennas and you can receive at many, many antennas. So this is what people call MIMO radar, and you can find papers on it. But it's a similar thing. You have a target. These are the two transmitters, and these are the three receivers. What I'm going to go after is the power. Okay? So let's think of them in a vector x. This is how much power I give to, to this anchor 1, anchor 2, and so on, all the, the anchors, all, all the bases. Okay? And I'm, what do I know? I know about my ultimate limits. I've already spent a couple of years working really, really hard to try to gain some insights, and this is what I know. Okay? I know that the trace of the inverse of the Fisher information, in fact, equivalent Fisher information, is a metric. Okay? And this is the right metric because it gives me the lower bound on a mean square error. Okay? So I'm going to focus on this as my uh, performance metric or cost function. And remember, this J matrix can be written at weighted sum of my, remember, my lambda times the J matrix. Okay? So this is my lambda and the J matrix. And J matrix is made out of a vector. And these vectors are just a, sort of a vector that uh, between uh, me and one of these anchors. So this is the vector. And uh, I've written in terms of a, a D and so on because I need to account for a path loss so that I can account for far away one and close, away, close by one. But what I wanted to really focus is this X because X are the variable. The question is what sort of Xs I should put there so that I can minimize the square position error bound. And you'll see that there is an analogy, the same sort of stuff. So I'm just going to focus on an easy one. The localization problem and radar problem is the same thing, except you have an extra sum. OK, so let's kind of try to focus on it. 
What I wanted to do is to deal with this quantity, trace of J inverse, it shows up in the same place, and the power sort of shows up in the same place, and uh, this stuff is sort of equivalent. And so what I'm going to do is that at the end, this is what I'm going to look at, and this J is given by this expression, and these are receiving nodes, and this is what I call, rather than ra uh, ranging information intensity, this we call it equivalent ranging coefficient, because I have factor out the transmit power. <clears throat> and that's the thing that I wanted to do. So by now, my problem is quite easy. I want to minimize this function such that the following constraint is true. Power has to be always positive, that all the power has to sum to some number, and this is constant, okay? So what is the best you can do in allocating x? So the question now is what's the optimal x that minimizes this? Okay, what's the optimal x that minimizes this? And by the way, I'm not really going to dwell on it. A lot of time, there are papers I've written thinking that this function is not convex in x, okay, not convex in x. So whenever you have a cost function which is not convex, your world is not as beautiful as you wish, okay? So what people do is that, well, if it's not so beautiful, you know, you put some, some other things on to make it beautiful, meaning you make it convex by approximate it, so people call relaxation method, and so on and so on. But it turns out that if you look at it in the right way, you can really prove that this thing is convex. So I'm just going to kind of flash you. There's a three, four different way to prove it, but we really can show that uh, this, this, this function is convex. When that function is convex, the game is almost over. You can buy a plane ticket for holidays, okay? And the game is going to be like this. In fact, if you learned a little bit of optimization, just one semester of optimization, you can look at this and say, hey, this is a structure that I can rewrite like this. And why do I rewrite, rewrite like this? And the, those who are in this business says, this is so-called semi-definite program. Okay, so you can basically download a packages from, say, you know, semi-definite program and you can run. And similarly, you says, well, you know, if I spend a little bit more and thinking of, of these in terms of a structure, I can show that this thing can write like this too. And the detail is not important, but this structure is called SOCP. It's called second order cone program, which is even better than STP, okay? So the point that I'm making is that the game is almost over. Buy your tickets to go on holidays. You can run this on your computer and it'll give you results. Okay, so you put down anchors randomly and you ask yourself, give me the vector x. This program or this program give, will give you x. And you do this again, put these uh, anchors randomly and give me the, another x and you find optimal x. And those are not any x, these are optimal x, right? This, that's why optimization techniques are very powerful. So you get these vector x, a lot of them, and you look at it and say, Wait a minute, these axes, a long vector of, I don't know, 100 by 100, let's say 100 vector, element in the vector because these are power of the 100 nodes, something like this. It's almost zero in, in, in all of them except very few, okay? So we're saying this, is, is, this cannot be a numerical coincidence. This gotta be true, okay? So with that motivation, we can go prove this and we show that in fact, if you're in a two-dimensional network, you don't need more than three anchors to allocate power, okay? So that's a pretty powerful statement. You don't need more than three anchors. So what does that mean? So the intuition is kind of like this. So let's suppose that you have a lot of anchors around you, you're here, and you're saying, how much power I should give it to this guy? And you say, you know what? Don't do power control, it's too far away, forget it. And how much power I have to give it to this guy? And you say, don't do it. You know why? Because I know that when I do this ranging, I will gain information only in one dimension. But if I have another guy slightly closer, I'd rather give power to this guy because I will 
measure this and this will give me bigger lambda. And so once I measure it, you don't want it to do this again. Okay? And similarly, this one, let's say it's going through some metal or, or non-line of sight and don't give a power, and the answer is going to be like this. Okay? So this is the intuition. So you only need to give power to three anchors. Okay, so this is another beautiful picture that I can kind of stop uh, telling you. This is so symmetric, so beautiful. And this is sort of a problem. This is like a toy example, and we want to do toy examples because we gain insight. So let's say that I have three anchors, and let's suppose that I know that I'm in region one. I can ask myself, who should I give power to in order to localize the best? And in fact, if I am in blue area, blue area, here, here, or here, I only need to give power to anchor B and anchor C, anchor B and anchor C, and you don't need to give any power to this. And similarly, if I'm here, I only need to turn on this anchor and this anchor and not this, and so on. So it's very, very symmetric. And, and uh, so we did this uh, numerically using uh, uh, our optimization problem. And I think I'm going to not talk about this. Basically, by doing so, you gain. And how much you gain depends on your scenario and so on. So that's why I didn't <coughs> want to show you this. But now I want to come back to this. So basically, this is how we think of power allocation and, and operating the network. And we have to also to think about scheduling. Who should you talk to? Uh, who should you transmit at what time? So this is a scheduling problem. The same way that you do in data network, in localization network, you need to think about scheduling. And I think um, what I am uh, ready to do now is that I'm ready to conclude because coffee break is coming. And my computer is also wanted to get stuck here. So I wanted to sort of make a quick conclusion, if you bear with me. And it's going to be very brief. We have a, a way to think about it, and we think about it very theoretical way. And that gives us how to design algorithms, so we can design localization algorithm in a cooperative, cooperative localization algorithm using message passing. We can do resource optimization algorithm based on the sparsity property that I just talked about. Uh, <clears throat> we are also trying to do soft decision making when we do ranging rather than doing hard detection, you know, like looking at energy and compare with the threshold. We don't want to do this, we want to do soft decision. But some of these things, you know, you have to sort of take it with a grain of salt because if your hardware doesn't allow you to do that, there's nothing you can do. But if the hardware manufacturer says, you know, if you can improve, we will let you improve, then you can do some of these things. <clears throat> and of course, we have to do experimentation, and with that, these are all the things that we've done in like the last five years. And uh, we have a great team, you can see, the Spanish guy, and, any, and many others. Um, so, uh, in fact, very international, two Korean. She's now a professor in Korea. She just took a job. He's now a professor in Thailand. And uh, many of them, uh, some of them are still uh, students. So this is really uh, a big team to, to put it together, something like this. Uh, people with theoretical background, people with algorithm background, and people who can uh, program. Um, and of course, my sponsors, without sponsors, <clears throat> you cannot do anything like this. <clears throat> so to summarize, I think 15 years ago, the question of the space being the next frontier is, is too old. We need to revisit, and we think that location is the next frontier. A lot of services are going to be based on location, and that will be interesting to see what's going to be like in the, this coming decade based on location services. So with that, I will say location, location and location and location and location and location. And so I wanted to, you know, take another moment to thank again. 
So I cannot speak, so I can only write. <clears throat> so I wanted to be back here, and I had a great time, and uh, I will all see you again. So I can take some questions, a few questions, and I can also take questions over a coffee break or lunch break or so on. I'll be around, or dinner, or, or after dinner over wine, you know, lots of things. So I'm, I'll be available throughout to, to talk to you. So uh, when you know, speaking of this uh, power consumption problem, so when you know where the guy you want to locate is, you can solve where, how to allo allocate power, right? And the general setting is, of course, that you don't know where the guy you want to locate it is. Uh, so how do you solve it so, then? Do, do you do a distribution? And, and, and uh, how, how does the calculations carry Yeah, through? so that, that's a very good question. And uh, that means that you follow my talk, basically. Uh, so uh, there are a number of ways to do this. And, and uh, what uh, we are doing, uh, so it's, it's what we call chicken and egg problem. You know, you wanted to localize where you are, and the way you do is that you, 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 you turn on these guys around you, but in order to know which one to turn on, I sort of have to know where I am. But I think that uh, many of the, 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 our experiences is that we are not in the world that we are completely lost. We kind of know where we are. And that's sort of also related to, you know, the old traditional, you know, Kalman filter, things like that, right? You know where you were in the past, you know where you're going next, that kind of stuff. So you have basically some uncertainty region, and we put a bound on it, and what we do is that we, call, we I, I, actually I can even point to you some, some uh, very reasonably carefully uh, put together document. What we do is that we do a robust uh, power allocation, meaning that Within that uncertainty, it will guarantee you some level of optimality, okay? And you can do it in a number of different ways. <clears throat> and in fact, this is an easy way to think about power allocation because I can put them in like a convex pro program and you can go do it, but we have been aspired more recently by people like you guys meaning we wanted to put our algorithm on uh, real devices, okay? And that's not so easy because we're not so good at doing this, okay? And so when we do this, first thing we realize is that I cannot install MATLAB on my gadget, okay? I cannot install MATLAB on my, I don't know, my iPhone or something. So I have to be more clever in implementing sort of stuff that I presented. And one of the things that we learned that I didn't have a chance to talk about is that we call it computational geometry approach to doing this optimization. And if you study, uh, we didn't know computational geometry either, by the way, but we ran into it and so we went and learned it. And we have now a new algorithm that doesn't require MATLAB, things like that, and we can actually implement them. We have. Uh, iterative process, we, iterative approach to some of these problems. So we have spent already quite a bit of time in, in thinking, and I can point to you a paper which will be probably out in uh, January, Transactions on Information Theory, uh, already accepted. So I can give you a preprint if you like. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It's a really very interesting. So, one question. Uh, in my understanding, the focus of this uh, work has been on, uh, um, let's say, best power allocation yes. in the sense of the metric, optimization matrix that you explained for a single user. Oh, I, um, I was thinking about uh, the uh, situation which you have, um, let's say, two, three, four users. You are challenging problem of finding the best power allocation for all of them. Of yeah. course, I think that you can uh, solve this problem with uh, 
sh scheduling or ta uh, time division or other uh, scheduling algorithms too. But this requires some sort of coordination among the users yes. and yes. the transmitters. In other ways, it could be a global optimization, considering the best power allocation for all of them. Mm -hmm. This another, uh, I was thinking something about a Pareto optimization, for instance, finding a different metric using uh, Pareto op uh, optimality mm -hmm. criteria and so mm -hmm. on. I just was asking if you already faced this kind of problem, also is the next steps for the future. Uh, so you notice our approach. We start with very little problem. We make it more complicated and so on. So I think power allocation uh, problem that I presented you and maybe the one that I just mentioned that you based on uh, computational geometry approach is sort of where we are. We haven't solved the problem that uh, you are talking about, but it's an important and practical problem. You know, we have maybe a way to, to, to have a version of it, and you already get a hint that we are doing scheduling. So when I am uh, here, uh, I'm going to figure out who my neighbors are, and I'm going to pick which three neighbors I'm going to use, and then so on. But certainly, I think coordinating all the nodes in the network and so on are important, uh, and, and certainly, you know, the, the first thing of doing uh, globally will give you the benchmark, but distributed implementations are, are also crucial, and these are the things that we haven't saw. You mentioned that the, uh, the signal-to-noise ratio of the, all that matters is the signal-to-noise ratio of the first arrival. Right. And you can kind of ignore the rest of it. But that would be true if that signal-to-noise ratio is high. If it is not high, then you would have to fall back to the second arrival, and then by, by the same token, all of them are important. And also it matters how close the second arrival is to, to the first one because that means how much uh, error you're going to have. So, of course, any of these statements, uh, to make it precise, you need to give you, I need to state all the conditions. And you're stating some of the conditions and, and so on. And in fact, I said that later multipaths are not useful. And that's not quite true if you know the geometry. So there are a few papers that you can find that talk about multipath assisted localization, and this is where you're going to use not just the first path, but later paths to really help you. But what we are doing here is the ultimate limit. So even if I have a, uh, a not so high signal to noise ratio, it's still good because I'm gaining information. That's my approach. Okay, how do you realize it is, is a, a, a slightly different question and maybe this is what you have in mind. And maybe if the signal to noise ratio is too low, then it's not worthwhile for you to, to, to process this or, or uh, extract information out of it. But as long as I can quantify, you see, any information is good as long as I can answer, uh, quantify the uncertainty. So if I knew the signal to noise ratio is low, and if I know what that is, it somehow should be useful. Uh, I think we should stop now for the coffee. And as, as Professor Mo said, you can discuss later um, along the day or even tomorrow, I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll be here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>